So one of the one of the things that people often tell me, well, you know, you're protected by tenure, professor. So it doesn't take such courage, Dr. Saad. Well, in 2017, I had to, whenever I would go to teach courses on campus, I had to be accompanied by security who would then lock the door of my class so that if people left the room, they'd have to knock to be let back in because of, of the number of death threats I was getting. When I would leave campus, when my wife would come to pick me up, I would literally have something akin to kind of a deflation from an anxiety attack because I didn't know when they were going to come at me. What upsets me about some of our common friends is that they're not willing to entertain that conversation, which, by mm. the way, speaks to an important thing in my book, which is the fact that you are educated and intelligent doesn't serve as an inoculation against you being parasitized by idea pathogens. Because many of our common friends have PhDs and they're accomplished and they've written great books. And guess what? They're some of the biggest sufferers of ostrich parasitic syndrome. Yeah, and that's not to throw anyone under the bus. I mean, this is, this is purely just to, I, I think, continue to try to wake people up to some of this stuff. Exactly. I, look, I, some of our common friends with whom I have, uh, by the way, yesterday I put up a thing where I was defending Richard Dawkins for having de been deplatformed at Trinity College Dublin. And a whole bunch of yeah, people crazy. were- Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. People were sending me angry emails saying, well, why are you defending him? You know how he was going crazy about Trump or how he's going crazy about Brexit. The fact that I defend him because of a universal principle doesn't imply that I have to agree or disagree with him on every other issue. And the fact that I have to enunciate this clearly to you shows you how parasitized most people are. 20 years ago, when you, when you were first teaching about this stuff, and, and even before that, when you were in school learning about all this, did you ever think that, this, that you were gonna be talking about politics? Because you, you spend a lot of time, you know, it's not that you're talking about politics all the time, but, but everything is now political. And you talk about politics on Twitter, and when I bring you on or you go on other shows, people ask you your thoughts on politics. Are you, or, or does that seem like it was gonna be the obvious end of all of this, that because of the way it spreads, that it would end up there? Not, no, I don't, I, I would be lying if I said I had the foresight of where my engagement was gonna go. What was clear from my training is I was studying psychology of decision-making. So one of the things when you study psychology of decision-making, one of the things you do is you study what's called rational choice. So for example, if I prefer car A to car B, and I prefer car B to car C, it has to be that I prefer car A to car C. That's called the transitivity axiom. If I violate this order of preference, then I am being, quote, irrational. So part of my training in my doctoral studies was to study psychology of decision-making or behavioral decision theory, which by the way, led to a Nobel prize to one of my professors at Cornell, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Richard Thaler. And so I come from, from a group of folks, several of whom have won the Nobel prize for demonstrating that economic decision-making is sometimes faulty. So it was already part of my training to study irrational behavior. But what was a surprise to me was that the irrationality would seep its way from this very circumscript, you know, mathematical axiom to politics, to popular culture. So in a sense, I was trained to look at human irrationality. I just didn't know that I would go into all these different fields. Yeah. Have you been, uh, we, we've talked about this a, a little bit, but since I haven't had you on for probably, maybe it's eight or 10 months or some, something around there. Maybe a bit um, longer, but yeah. May, may, maybe even longer. Um, can you just talk a little bit about what it's like just sort of in the world of academia right now and just dealing with other professors and have you been ostracized by other people and, and the yes. other, other kind of headaches? Because I think humanizing some of that stuff, you, you're, you know, you're not just some spinning uh, neuron out there. You're, you're a human. You've got a, a family and people you work with and the rest of it. It's not that this has no cost. Some might say a very good looking human, but yes. Uh, a, a gorgeous bronze <laughs> man. Uh, so I'll, I'll answer this in several ways. So one of the one of the things that people often tell me, well, you know, you're protected by tenure, professor. So it doesn't take such courage, Dr. Saad. Well, in 2017, I had to, whenever I would go to teach courses on campus, I had to be accompanied by security who would then lock the door of my class so that if people left the room, they'd have to knock to be let back in because of, of the number of death threats I was getting. When I would leave campus, when my wife would come to pick me up, 
I would literally have something akin to kind of a deflation from an anxiety attack because I didn't know when they were going to come at me. Are the three guys that are in the elevator with me, are they the ones who are going to decapitate me? So tenure doesn't protect you from that. Tenure doesn't protect you from all of the opportunities I would have had as an academic, other job offers, higher salary. I've been denied now several years in a row a chaired professorship, which I had held for 10 years, and it would be a cinch for me to get it renewed. But because now how outspoken I am and as known as I am now, a lot of people who would be sitting on the committees to decide whether to give me the chaired professorship or not are not very happy with my supposed big mouth and irreverent attitude. And therefore, I don't get that chaired professorship. That chaired professorship comes with a lot of money. But do you think it's because they're, do you think it's because they are so infected that they're against the ideas or that they perhaps subtly agree with you? I suspect some of people in your department probably agree with you, but don't want to publicly, you know, if they're they're the ones that vote on you getting in, well, now they're screwed. So, and that goes to the cowardice thing that we were talking about earlier. I get that. I get that a lot. You're absolutely right that the silent majority, I think, even within academia, uh, is not on board with this lunacy. But, but again, the fact that they are a minority doesn't suggest that their diabolical destruction is not something to worry about, right? I always tell people how how many how many committed zealots did it take to bring down the twin towers? Was it 190,000 people? No, it took 19 people, right? So I don't need. 9,000 blue-haired social justice warriors on campus to keep the rest of us be quiet. I just need a few of them that are a lot more vociferous and committed than the rest of us, and then they they will cow us into silence. So I think many professors are exactly what you said. They write to me, thank you so much, you're keeping me sane. I don't know how you have the courage to do this. I would have left academia were it not because of you. And then they will often write, So what do you suggest I do because I'm afraid? And then I always tell them the same thing. It sounds harsh, but it really is. It cuts to the the, the truth. The the 18-year-old guys who landed on Normandy were not granted safe passage. They knew that 60, 70% of them would be mowed down like little mosquitoes, and yet they did it so that Dave Rubin and Gad Saad could sit here and speak freely today. So whatever it is that you are afraid of, it is a lot less than the guys who landed on Normandy. So stop being a coward and speak out. It's so interesting because, you know, I don't come from the world of academia. So I think one of the things that has harmed some of our friends' ability to talk about this stuff is they still want to be liked in those circles. You come from those circles and you've paid a price. I don't come from those circles. So that, that cost is very low for me. But what I find is I'm very frustrated by the people right now. It's like, look, Trump is getting critical race theory out of the federal government. That is incredible. Right, that's what what everybody, what we've all been talking about identity politics. It's like he's getting it out of the federal government and the contractors the feds can work with. He got rid of Title IX. That meant where you know, in effect, there was no due process anymore. I thought liberals were for due process, but it's like they can't give him that credit. So my my frustration these days is so aimed at at what was my side that it's it's. It's not a comfortable spot to be in, actually. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about academia instead of nonstop yelling, check out our academia playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, check out our full episode playlist. They're all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.